What's up, everyone, and welcome to episode 271 of Two Amazon Sellers and a Microphone, brought to you by Solozo. And uh, today, longtime friend joining us again, our friend Brother from across the pond, right? I was just going to say, our, our good friend from across the pond, Ben Leonard, we've had you on uh, at least two times. Uh, yeah, that's here. Uh, Third time lucky. I'll, I'll try not to suck this time. <laughs> no, no, you're always good, and we always love talking to you. And you know, we've we've spent uh, you know the last two episodes talking about exits, and you know, you, you sold your business, and then you started ecom brokers to help others exit out of their business. Uh, but we haven't really, di you know, dived into your whole story and like, we, you know, how to crush it in e-commerce, you know, and all the things that uh, the pitfalls and everything else. So we're really excited. We love getting people on and just diving into the story. Like, how did you get into e-commerce and, and everything else? But, you know, so I mean, obviously you're going to be a great person to talk to. We're excited about everything. So how are you doing, Ben? I am really well, thanks. Uh, there's been a whole lot of stuff happening. It's been great fun. I just got back from Seller Sessions Live, uh, which is probably the best e-commerce conference in the UK. Uh, that was great fun. I had the honor of speaking at it, which was which was uh, both nerve wracking and and awesome because there was a, the other speakers were all fantastic people that I really respect and admire. So to get the opportunity to speak alongside them was great, and it was a a fun weekend. And I'm now I'm just kind of getting back to reality. How how was that conference? I'm curious. Like, fantastic. Are we seeing more sellers actually co going to conferences now, yeah. or is it still this bunch of software providers and speakers? No, it was so good. So I've been to each seller sessions live. I think there's been four, maybe even five events now. And uh, yeah, this was the first one I spoke at. And you know what was so great is there's always a decent number of speakers there, like, uh, sorry, sellers there. This year was just like seller tastic. <laughs> there was very yeah. few uh, service providers or aggregators. Sure, there were some service providers who had a booth, but it was all very like, it wasn't salesy. It was like, you know, when people went during the breaks, when you went out to get a cup of coffee, there were people there with a booth. And if you wanted to go chat, you could, right? But the the actual audience was, you know, jam-packed with sellers and legit sellers doing decent numbers who um, are building serious brands and interested in, in learning serious content. It was really, really good. And the atmosphere was great. And there were none of these sort of, um, you know, you get the in the past, there's been situations, not just at this conference, at other conferences too, right, where an aggregator will kind of fly in under the radar and they won't use like their company email addresses to do it. And they'll buy like tons of tickets for their entire teams. And when they when several aggregators do this, suddenly you've got dozens and dozens of people who aren't even sellers. Mm -hmm. It's really frustrating. Mm -hmm. Or these like, you know, these kind of groups, these these groups that are trying to get you to come in and spend, you know, thousands of dollars to join their special group. And if you don't join their special group, you're going to suck at e-commerce. Um, there weren't too many of those either. So it was a really fun weekend. What did you, uh, what was your presentation about? Would you, would you ch uh, touch on? Yeah, I was speaking about how to blow up your particular, the Amazon side of your e-commerce business. Cause it was an Amazon conference. Um, by getting out of the Amazon goldfish bowl, that was the, the kind of the, the analogy I used. So, so many, so many, even now in 2023, right? I see this all the time with businesses that come across my desk. So many people who are building an e-commerce business, A, they're not building a brand and B, even if they are, they're stuck in this Amazon goldfish bowl because all they're doing is focusing on Amazon. So it's like, if their business is the goldfish, they get a bit of fish food and then they're searching for the next bit of fish food. But if you play your cards right and you actually build a relationship with the customer and give them an experience after they bought the product, you're not kind of stuck in that cycle because sure, you want to acquire new customers, but if you've sold, if I've sold a product to you, Chris, and you forget all about my brand, when you need widget B that I also sell, you know, you bought widget A, you're just going to go search on Amazon. But if I built a relationship with you, Dustin, and sold you widget A, then gave you tons of value and made you know, like, and trust me, when you need widget B, you're going to come back to my brand. Whether it's on Amazon or off Amazon, I don't really care. So that's the kind of stuff I was talking about. And at Seller Sessions Live in particular, people want juicy marketing. So I was presenting some of my sort of juiciest, funnest stuff that I did with my first brand that made me do this, build like this sort of cult-like following of fans who'd buy all my stuff. 
my competitors didn't. So I ended up you know, leaving them behind. And that's what led to somebody wanting to buy my brand after several years. What are, what are some of the things that you touched on? I mean, we've touched on this podcast about insert cards, QR codes, you know, emails. Yep. What's, what's the thing that yeah. you found most value with? Sure. So I, I presented to I, the, the, the other analogy I presented, right? So it was the goldfish bowl, right? But the other one was this. Uh, you got to eat your vegetables first, which is building a legitimate brand that looks and feels and behaves like a consumer packaged goods brand that has off Amazon assets, builds a relationship with its customers, is focused on a quality product first and a quality experience, right? And I gave the so I gave the audience a little bit of a lecture, right? Mm -hmm. And then I said, right, look, I know you've had enough of that. You've had enough vegetables. Let's get to the fun bit that you actually want, which is the burgers, right? So then I touched on some fun yet grounded in marketing principles stuff that I'd done. You know, it's all it's all based on the principles of Caldini and Seth Godin, right? This stuff isn't going away, even if the platforms change and the technology changes. So, you know, the first example I gave was uh, the way in which I would use to and still do actually use chatbots. I'm not talking about chat GPT. I'm talking about Facebook Messenger chatbots, which are not dead. I remember when when chatbots came out, everybody said, oh, email's now dead. Of course, email isn't dead. And chatbots are not dead yet either. And, and I don't think they're going to die. So I gave an example of how you would buy my product within the product packaging or insert is a URL and a QR code. So the customer has a choice. It says, look, here's you want the user guide to use this product. You know, Don't use the product without the guide. Get it here. You scan the code or click the URL and you get the guide, but it's delivered in a, in a chatbot. From there, you give the customer a link to grow. So now they're subscribed to your chatbot, right? So that's touch point number one, where you can build a relationship, market to them, send them valuable content even, right? From there, you give them the link to go get the, 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 the user guide. And guess where that is? That's on your website. Guess what you do? You pixel them so you can follow them around the internet. So that's touch point number two. If you want to, you could even put that behind an email gate. Now, there's a bit of a trade-off there because when you do that, that increases resistance. So conversion will drop off, but you can test it. But if you do put it behind an email gate, now you've got their email address. That's touch point number three. So pretty basic stuff, but tons of people don't do that. Mm -hmm. And then That's I explained... The thing anymore, right? Like people started doing that and then they just forgot about it and went on yeah. to rebates and whole search find buy kind of deals. Absolutely. But you don't have to do that. You can still use it just to deliver a user guide. And then you have yeah. them in your chatbot. You could get their email address. You've definitely pixeled them from your website. When they go to your website, they might discover you have a really helpful blog. And then they keep coming back to get valuable content. And guess what? Then when they need something, they go to you. But then the other thing I was saying was, okay, so let's take this a step further. What if your product requires a bit of education on how to use it? Well, as well as giving them the user guide in the chat, but what if we said, oh, and if you click this link, here's a video on how to use it. So they click the link and they land on your YouTube channel. Now, this is exactly what I did with one of my products. It was a pair of boxing hand wraps. So I'd say, hey, um, if you want to learn how to wrap your hands, click this link and there's a video. I recorded this video of myself wrapping my hands with my boxing hand wraps at my kitchen table. And that video has had 5 million views. <laughs> but I did... I did no marketing of that video other than I just slapped it in the chat bulb where I drove my customers. I was just giving value to my customers. Now, I didn't sell 5 million pairs of boxing hand wraps, which I had. <laughs> so what happened? Well, I was just giving them valuable content, but then by driving them to this video, I was giving YouTube a signal that this was a valuable video. So then YouTube showed that video to people who didn't know my brand, but did want to know how to wrap their hands for boxing. Right. So they're searching. So then this drives new leads. They watch the video. They click the link. They they go to my Amazon listing and Amazon likes external traffic. So now I'm spiking two algorithms, the YouTube algorithm and the Amazon algorithm. And kind of they're both feeding off of each other. Mm -hmm. And these people are subscribing to my channel where guess what? I cross sell them more products. So this is how I'm escaping the Amazon goldfish bowl because my competitors aren't doing that. And I don't just have to cross sell them products. I can offer them other valuable, helpful content on the channel that's not selling stuff, but it's going to make them love me. This took days to make. 
Oh, the whole like the video. Well, yeah, the whole flow. I and the video in like a you know half an hour. Set up my phone, made sure you know to did it in a couple of takes. Like, don't think I did any special editing. Uploaded it to YouTube, and then bashed out a chat bot, which didn't take that long. <laughs> um, you know, it's not <laughs> it's not that hard. People don't think about it. I don't yeah. understand. Maybe it's just because that's how my brain's wired. And then I was explaining. And you could go a step further, right? You could actually game the out YouTube algorithm even more by on your packaging or your insert or anywhere actually in your email marketing or chatbots, you can drive people to your YouTube channel and pretty much guarantee that they're going to subscribe. So what you do is you take your YouTube channel URL and you just append this little code to it. You just append question mark sub underscore confirmation equals one and what happens is on desktop or laptop when they click your the link a little box comes up asking if they want to subscribe and 99.9 percent .9 of people are just going to click yeah mm -hmm. and if they're on mobile that box does not appear but it is a deep link into um the youtube app and the subscribe button is like there like right there and people are just going to press it and so I was saying to the to the to this the audience, and so what you can do then is you can turn it into a pretty link. So you make that long, you know, sub underscore confirmation equals one link, but then you just go yourbrand.com slash yt, make a nice navigation relink, uh, forwarding link, and put that wherever you want. So I was saying to the audience, look, try this. Go to benleonard.pro slash yt and see what happens. And that was quite a fun little growth hack for me because then everybody in the audience is doing yeah, it. Yeah, everybody went to it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So that was just one example. And I gave like five of these, I, I, I called them burgers, right? I was like, look, eat your vegetables first and then we can do this fun stuff, have these burgers. And it went well. Um, what, are, what are some other things that you, because, you know, it's been a while sure. since Bustin and I have been to a conference. What are some things, you know, AI is the big, you know, buzzword now. What was else, What were some other things people were touching on? Yeah, some really fun stuff. Um, so Danny McMillan, who hosts the podcast, uh, uh, well, the, the, pod, the Seller Sessions podcast and hosts the Seller Sessions conference, right. um, he had a great presentation about uh, content creation for um, vertical format content creation for Reels and TikToks. And he was demonstrating his funnel for his new brand that uh, so the physical product side of that brand doesn't exist yet because what he's doing is he's building an audience on Instagram and TikTok by making these reels go viral. And it's that's the top of funnel. And as he builds the audience, this is the very clever bit next, is you, you, you're you not going to get, he's, he's, he's building the audience on his channel. He's making a new podcast, okay, for that channel. Podcast doesn't exist yet. Why? He wants to interview big names. Big names will not come on his podcast unless he can prove reach and engagement. He has to do that first by building up these TikTok and Instagram feeds, right? You look at some of these popular podcasts like Diary of a CEO, right? They are built on having these huge audiences on Instagram and TikTok. So then he gets the big names on his podcast and then the whole thing starts going, going, going. And that's when he launches his physical products brand. And so his presentation was about the science and art of actually making these reels work. It was really clever stuff. He was talking about like how you take, take some popular audio and time the audio perfectly with the hook of what you're actually saying related to your brand. And when you do that, you know, the human brain loves that and is likely to remember it, to like it, to engage with it. That was a really interesting presentation. Hmm. And then you had Anthony Lee. Uh, mm -hmm. He was in the space a few years ago. I remember seeing Anthony at like seller sessions in 2019, talking about totally different stuff. He kind of left e-commerce and now he's back and he's got into AI in a big way. I really recommend people look up his stuff. It's really quite incredible. And he was demonstrating the power of AI for e-commerce business owners. Not just, you know, people are talking a lot about, oh, you can download reviews, upload them to ChatGPT and analyze what they say. And like, that's true. But, you know, okay, 
that's been repeated a thousand times on LinkedIn. Anthony has built these incredible automations using tools like Zapier and Make to allow you to um, do quite remarkable things, such as your customer service emails, all through ChatGPT. So it's not just like, you know, in, in email marketing tools like, say, Klaviyo or MailChimp or whatever, you can send out these um, replies that are just going to be the same for everyone. We're talking about ChatGPT literally writing a personalized email for the person hmm. based on what they said before. Wow. Pretty insane. And so the reason I love that is because it's just completely outside the box of the standard kind of being done a million times stuff that you'd expect to hear at an e-commerce conference, you know, external traffic, PPC, reviews, listing yeah. optimization, images, et cetera. So yeah, it was great stuff. That's good. That's good. We haven't, again, we haven't been to a conference in a while. So it's, it's nice to, nice to hear that people are coming to them. Yeah. And there's different topics being discussed other than just, yeah. you'll, you'll have to come next year. You have to come across the pond. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely would have to do that. Yeah. Those are interesting. I, I, that is, again, like you said, when I go to, when we did go to a lot of conferences, uh, I mean, it's just fun to hear the things that no one's talking about or the things that, you know, really outside the box. And, and just like you were talking about with, with your brand, all those things you did, anything that you're doing that your competitors aren't doing can only be a lift, can only be helpful. Yeah. To you, to your customers, to everybody else. Yeah, you're right. You know what, right? I was kind of apprehensive about what I was presenting because some of it was stuff I was doing a few years ago and I am doing it again now with my new brands. But I thought to myself, surely this can't be right. It can't be that nobody's doing this. But every business, almost every business that comes across my desk, people aren't doing it. And so many people I speak to, they're not doing it. So I thought, screw it, I'm going to go and do this and see what the reaction is. And lo and behold, the crowd was flabbergasted by the stuff I was presenting. And I was getting all these people coming up to me afterwards. But to me, I just don't get it. It's like you're building a brand. So why would you not want to do this? Why would you not want to create an experience? And I think the answer is that so many people bought into and are still buying into this whole just sell stuff on Amazon and get rich quick scheme thing rather than building a brand and amazon is a, is a sales channel and then they wonder why you know you know to touch back on the mergers and acquisitions thing for a minute yeah like two years ago you could sell your pretty crappy business that was just selling a random stuff on amazon for quite a lot of money and quite a lot of people with terrible businesses got really rich and yeah good on them and now they're wondering why no one wants to buy their business it's because they they haven't got a legit brand with a sustainable future ahead of it so people say oh yeah the bottom's fallen out of the um the m a market in e-commerce hasn't it and i'm like well that depends like if you're mm -hmm. selling rubbish then yeah if you've got a great brand then no you can still sell your business for for a great exit well for sure and i like the aggregators fell into that trap by buying those brands and then they were totally. getting burned on the flip side like yeah that's <clears throat> you, you know, they're saturated markets, lots of Me Too products. This one happens to be working right now. Yeah. It's got good numbers. It's, it's not You're completely work. right. You're it's completely right. And, and even, even some of the brands that were like actually not that bad, the problem that they faced was it was easier. They bought it in conditions which were much easier. And now Amazon is way harder. It's harder to rank. It's harder to get reviews. When there are little loopholes and hacks that appear, they get shut down fast. And of course, it's way more of a pay to play playground. So a business that was scraping by with not great margins before, and maybe a really slow cash conversion cycle, but was doing, a, it was, it was, the, the, it was easy enough to get by because it was, the game was easier. Well, now it's way harder. And so those brands that aggregators built are the ones that have tanked, uh, bought, sorry, are the ones that have tanked. What's going on in the space? I mean, you, you got econ brokers. Uh, first of all, how's that doing? And then what are you seeing? in the acquisition space is multiples obviously have come down, I'm sure after, yeah. uh, after a couple of years, but what's, what's going on there? Yeah. So I'm way more positive now than I was this time last year. 2022 was a, was a tough year. Um, and we, we, we were fine cause we were really lean. Um, we also took on quite a lot more mentoring clients. So people who weren't ready to sell and needed work to do, we kind of mentor them. We have a mentored route to exit program that we do. 
because you know because we're not just like middlemen who are trying to flip stuff but we've got experience on you know i i own and operate brands john owns and operates brands and used to be at, at amazon so he's an insider and allison is a, is an accountant of like 30 years experience that means that actually we can mentor people to get them where they need to be rather than just being like oh yeah we'll flip your business and, and email a bunch of buyers so from that point of view we're we're fine in 2023 is looking a lot more rosy and what's actually really interesting is who's buying um we're seeing a lot more if, if we're going to talk about aggregators right because we don't just sell to aggregators we sell to private individuals and sort of you know big boy private equity and strategics but if we're going to talk about aggregators because that's for many people listening if they're going to sell their business it will be an aggregator deal um the european aggregators are um way more active than americans at the at the moment hmm. um which is interesting um same with some of the in the the other the aggregators in in, in asia um several aggregators for, who are still in buying mode despite having some pretty high profile issues you know there were you listeners will be aware or may not be aware so if they're not i'll tell them <laughs> that there are there's at least one famous european aggregator who has been in the news lately because they're getting sued because they failed allegedly failed to operate the brand properly which is why it didn't hit its earnout targets and the seller is suing them because they didn't fulfill their part of the bargain allegedly that aggregator and others are still in buying mode which is quite fascinating uh when you think about it uh and also several of them are still raising money we're still getting the press releases every so often that x amount has been raised which is interesting some of the original the og <laughs> ags um are back in 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 buying mode which is is fascinating they've taken some time to get their shit together we hope um in terms of their actual operational capability, I'm still a bit skeptical. Um, and they're back. Uh, but what's very interesting is that their deal criteria now is very different than it used to be. Mm. Um, they're, they're, they're willing to look at much smaller things. Um, and there is a much stronger emphasis on year-on-year -year growth, strong margin, and legit brand identity. And what kind of multiples stuff. are we seeing? Like 2X, 3X still? Well, that question, I will answer it, but it's a question that people love to ask because it's a sexy topic. But let me just give you a bit of a context, right? Before I give you my answer. We recently had a business that was doing 194 grand in SDE and the multiple was 5.15X, okay? Contrast that with a business doing half a million in SDE, so like more than double, only going for something like a 3.2. Why? Well, and this is what this is why my answer is 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 vague, because the business that smaller business that went for a 5.15, very strong brand, exciting stuff going on in the marketing department interesting ip well strong ip position good year on your growth exactly in the niche that the buyer wanted it, it was an acquisition that made a lot of sense for that buyer considering their portfolio and timing wise that buyer had the capital to deploy and wanted to deploy it now okay the brand with the higher sde and the lower multiple on the other hand less strong brand growth not as um steep growth opportunities not so attractive opportunities to expand the brand less attractive you, you get the idea yeah right? so a lot more than just looking at the numbers it's, it's a lot way more, more than just looking yeah. at the numbers that's yeah good. That's good to hear um it's and that's what happens when you go through a mature mergers and acquisitions process and instead of just saying i'm gonna treat my business like a garlic press and list it on some website um mm -hmm. So, you know, then to, but people are still going to be saying, people will still be listening saying, but Ben, what are the multiples? So mm -hmm. I'll tell you, it'll be extremely it, vague for the reason I just yeah. described. Um, anywhere between two and six, right? <laughs> not a ridiculous answer, right? So, but, you know, more, more often than not, it's in the three to four range. 
It makes sense though. I mean, it shows that the aggregators and the buyers are getting smarter uh, yeah. about what they're trying to do. They've, they've uh, for sure taken their lumps uh, over these last couple of years and in, in mistakes that they've made. Um, but I think it goes to your, to your initial point though, of, you know, this is to be the thing you're focusing on. If you're trying to crush it, if you're trying to grow a business, if you're trying to grow an attractive business, it's gotta be something that is attractive. It's sustainable. It's got growth opportunity. Uh, it's got the, the tribe of customers built around it, uh, that are, that are looking to buy whatever the new product is that's coming out, that they're yep. getting more than, than just a product. I mean, I know Chris can can uh, can say the same thing probably, and probably Ben you as well. But some some of the first products I launched were, but it was at a different time. I mean, it was early; it was two thousand fourteen when you, when you could do this kind of things. Yeah, but they were. It was like you know, do some product research, find something that's selling really well. Yeah, put a logo on it, and look. And I there's nothing like the thing is, I don't blame people from that time doing that because. It worked. You made you made a bunch of money. It worked. It's just that you got to then evolve with the times, right? Mm -hmm. um, something you just said, right, put off a light bulb in my head. And it reminded me of another example I gave at, at Seller Sessions. And I'm going to share it now because I want to make sure that people have actionable stuff as well, right? Let's give them some some kind of some some more burgers. So this is a fun one. Um, you should be encouraging your customers to post about your product on social. Perhaps your insert or your packaging encourages them if they post on social and uh, you tag you, they'll be entered into a monthly prize draw or something, right? Probably you don't even need to do that because if you have a great product, people just post about it anyway because people love to post on social for um, because they want attention. That's why people do that. Mm -hmm. So then you, and I was doing this with every customer who posted about us on Instagram, when we, even when we were doing like $6 million a year in sale sales i wasn't my team was but this does scale people be like oh but ben this doesn't scale it does you just give your team templates and sops here's what you do get your team to search every day for people who follow you so new followers people who've posted your product and tagged you or used your hashtags and message everyone who follows you thanking them engage them in a real conversation comment on every post and, and make it an insightful and meaningful comment and message that person too. And take 30 seconds to scan their profile and learn something about them and message them, okay? And when you do that, you will blow their minds because they're, they post it on, on social because they want attention, but they're getting attention from a brand that they just posted about. So let's say like, if we're gonna use my previous fitness brand as an, exa as an example, and Chris has just posted about, I don't know, he's just set a deadlift personal best with my weightlifting straps, right? Somebody in my team would message him saying, oh, hey, Chris, you know, great, great effort with your, with, with your deadlifts. Uh, glad you love the lifting straps, you know, and you've looked at his profile, right? And you can see that he was in San Francisco the other week, right? Oh, I saw your trip to San Fran and your post looked amazing. I love that place, right? You've paid attention to him. It's an authentic comment. It's not just some generic copy paste rubbish. And then you have a back and forth conversation. And then perhaps you offer Chris a discount. He's going to feel very grateful, a lot of reciprocity towards you. Perhaps you're going to go and ask him to leave a review, which he probably will because you've paid attention to him, meaningful attention, right? Not just generic nonsense. And you've you've given him a deal. That's fantastic. But then here's the bit that, that the light bulb went off in my head. You save that post to a collection, okay? As you can do in Instagram, all right? So let's say if you're selling weightlifting gear like this example, you'd save it to your... U.S. weightlifting fans collection. Three months later, you're launching a new weightlifting product. All you have to do is come back to your collection and open the post so you can see who it is again. Click on the person's username, open the DMs again, and pick up the conversation. Hey, Chris, how is your training going? Blah, 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 blah. Have a chat. By the way, we're launching our new weightlifting belt. Would you like to get it for half price? Of course you would. You give them the keywords, search, find, buy, Track it in Google Sheets. 10 days later, you remember to go and ask for a review. Raving fans who will buy all your stuff, giving you super cheap launches that are guaranteed to have reviews that stick and guaranteed to get the keyword ranking that you want. 
it's just an absolute no brainer because you're outside the goldfish bowl and you've made that relationship because you took the time to do it. And your competitors who are just on the flat, the hamster wheel, trying to acquire more customers constantly are scratching their heads going, oh, I don't know how to launch my product because they haven't built a relationship. I just sent a message to my designer. If you saw me type in, <laughs> uh, we want to add tag us to our insert and um, don't publish these 10,000 inserts yet until we put like some sort of like tag us yeah. uh, on your photo. Somebody yeah. said that because I, I literally have an order going through right now and I wanted to make sure that we had that. So here's, here's the next that. level hack that you can do, right? This is a really fun one. What if in the DM, instead of saying, oh, Chris, uh, if you want to get 20% uh, off anything on our website, here's a code, you could do that. But what if you, I, I gave you a digital product for free, but to get the digital product, you had to complete a checkout. It's free. Like the, the checkout value is zero. Okay. Here's what, what I would do. Let's say, forget the weightlifting brand because I got a better example now. Let's say I've got a knitting brand, right? And Chris loves knitting. <laughs> so he's bought my knitting needles and posted about them on Insta and we're, ha we're, we're having this chat in the DMs, right? And I say, listen, man, because you're awesome, uh, I'm going to send you uh, a, my new digital knitting pattern for free. It's usually $20, but you can get it for free. Just go to this link. And the link is a direct link to cart on my Shopify site. Direct with a pre-applied discount where you can see, like you can literally see in the checkout, was 20 bucks, now zero. So you're feeling really grateful. This is amazing. Ben's just giving me 20 bucks off this digital knitting pattern. Everyone else has to pay 20 bucks for it, but I'm getting it for free. And all I have to do is pop my email address in. So now you've, you, you, you complete the checkout. I have your email address because you're basically my customer on Shopify now, but it was a free transaction. I can now market to you, do whatever I want, et cetera. All the, the fun things you can, you can do with upselling and cross-selling emails and all that good stuff. But actually, if people use their brains and install a plugin on their Shopify site, like One Click Upsell by Zipify, immediately after you've paid zero for that digital product, I can get you with a One Click Upsell paid post-checkout upsell. So then you're feeling super grateful. You're like, this guy's just giving me this thing that was 20 bucks for nothing. He's trying to upsell me on this like $10 knitting wool carrier. Sure, I'm going to go and do it. Hmm. I like this. this it's just easy. And people don't do it. It is. I mean, listen, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, I know I can see people who are listening to this right now. It's the same way that sometimes I get, like if I go to a conference and I hear something like this, I'm like, oh, it is. That seems so easy and, to, and do it. And then it's just like, it just slips away. It's like, you don't take the first step to integrate it and it just kind of yeah. fades away or it just seems overwhelming. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's just, it goes back to the whole thing. It's just like, it's, if you do one thing at a time, that is easy. Just do well, that one thing today. I just made, I actually, now that I think about it, I, I didn't even think of this. Uh, there is a page where people can go and get all the tips in detail that I'm talking about here. There's like a handbook and actually a video where I talk about it. So people want to, the URL is, um, it's benleonard.pro slash SSL 2023. Pro slash SSL 2023. If you go there, you can get a handbook and a link to a video where I explain all these examples. There's like, there's like a WhatsApp one. Um, there's a there's a, an example on how to what you should be, you know, another way to get out of the goldfish bowl. Your brand could have a podcast. I give an amazing growth hack to grow your podcast to get tons and tons of listeners on your podcast. Who are going to hear you as an authority on the topic so you've got a pickleball podcast right they hear you as an authority guess who sponsors the podcast well it's your podcast brand isn't it and maybe you give them a deal as well at the end of every episode or in the middle of every episode your competitors aren't doing that they're stuck in the amazon goldfish bowl that's another one or another one where you know remember earlier i was talking about my boxing hand wraps video and how we got five million views you know i gave an example of 
you know, you, you go to the link to find out more, but basically it was how you could get your customers to book a live lesson with you, a one-on-one -on -one lesson on how to wrap their hands or change the oil in their ride-on lawnmower or uh, start their digital knitting pattern, whatever it is. And people will say, oh, but that doesn't scale. You're right, that doesn't scale. But then you could scale that up to driving tons of people all to a webinar direct from your from your product. All good fun stuff. You know, I guess you could call it growth hacking. So, again, this is I love this stuff. And in this every the what came to my mind as you're going through this, and I'm I'm taking this back to uh, this, you know, budding entrepreneur who's wanting to start uh, a brand or start selling. And I was thinking about what you're saying is like, you know, one of the reasons that you were able to more easily achieve this is I think is because you liked the brand, you liked the products you were selling. Yeah. You were, you were a customer. Yes. You, it was, and, and, you know, I just, I feel like that's so important. You're uh, if you don't, you can't like who's going to be a better voice for your brand than you. Uh, if you are in love with the hobby or the product or whatever it is, if you're just doing, if you're just saying, "Oh, I found on Helium Ten that jump ropes sell really well," but you don't give a crap about jump roping, you become it becomes difficult for you to create all this stuff you're doing. You're hundred percent right. You are 100% right. And you know what? It's funny, right? You, you just mentioned, it's actually a story that's going in my book. Uh, I'm releasing a book in, in October. Uh, it's a bit far out, so we can talk about it properly another day. But you just reminded me of a little story there when you're mentioning checking on Helium 10, right? And and in fact, jump ropes, because the first product I released was a jump rope. Because <laughs> I did a lot of, 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 of rope jumping, jumping rope, whatever, in my CrossFit training and my boxing training when I started my brand. And so I, I placed my first order for like uh, 500, 500 jump ropes, right? Not, not many <laughs> for a bit of context. When I sold my business, the, the final order for that product that I placed with my manufacturer before, before I sold it was for a quarter of a million of those jump ropes. Oh. Anyway. So I'd, uh, <laughs> I'd placed the order. It was coming on a boat. And then I'd been listening to all these podcasts and hearing about these tools that I should be using. And I went and checked all these tools and <laughs> was immediately convinced that I'd picked a dud product and I shouldn't <laughs> sell it. So I called Scott Volker on The Amazing Seller. Oh, like, on his I, love I, love, I love that podcast, right? Scott's a dude. He was the OG. Anyway, so on his podcast, he had this thing where you could leave a voice message on his website. Oh, no, yes, I remember that. And he would, he would like play it. So I phone up and you can hear the fear in my voice. And I'm like, <laughs> I think I picked a dud. What do I do? And he plays it. And his response is basically, you'll be fine. Like it's 500 units, slash your price and sell through your inventory if you need to. And in the end, of course, I didn't need to do that because these tools were BS because it was about building a brand that connected with my customers. I'm providing a real experience rather than just trying to sell stuff. That's and funny. it's funny. I'm not saying these tools are useless. They're absolutely not. They they have a place in your toolbox, but you don't base your entire business on them. Yeah. You look at them different. I know I do. And I know Dustin does as well. Like when you're building a brand, if a product fits within your brand, like just put it in there. Your customers are looking for it, regardless oh, of what the yeah. competitive score is or whatever. Exactly, exactly. Like perhaps there's a case for saying like your first product. Right. Well, not perhaps, there is. There is a case for saying your first product, I call it your keystone product. You'd be absolutely bananas. You'd be bananas, in my opinion, to try to launch a jump rope on Amazon now, right? Oh, sure. Or a particular for sure. Type of as your first product. But... After you've built a legion of raving fans who love you and who you're DMing to launch your new products, for instance, then you can launch a jump rope because they'll go and buy it. They don't want your competitors one. They want everything to be your brand. They want all their knitting stuff to be your brand. If they're a professional dentist, they want all their professional dentistry equipment to be your brand. Whatever you, whatever you're into. Um, and when you get to that point, it's actually like a, a sigh of relief because <laughs> you can... Basically, yeah. just launch anything Absolutely. to your customers. Yes, yes, and that's that's when all the grinding away to begin with becomes worth it. Yeah, I can attest to this. Uh, 
it's so interesting. The I was in the fitness space too when I first started. I did I started with resistance bands. Yep. Um and I mean it took off. It was great. I quit my and I look back and I'm like, I didn't really put a whole lot of effort into it. Like it wasn't a full to the point where my full like branding, like I just thought, oh, I'm I can keep throwing products at this. And anyway, but by, by the time that had done really, really well. I'd quit my job. Uh, I'm like, I'm going to go full in. And I was like, I'll just try to build a brand off this. And then ha ended up not being able to trademark that brand name. Because back then you didn't, you know, brand registry and all that stuff wasn't super yep. critical uh, when they were pushing it. So I was kind of back engineering it. Couldn't do it. But at that time, the market was still pretty good. I was like, let me launch. So I actually launched a CrossFit jump rope. And it was almost, and it was, yeah, I, <laughs> here's, here's how a person who built a really good brand like Ben can just dominate somebody else trying to enter the market uh, because it was impossible. I mean, it was, there was no way I was going to be able to scale that without a monster advertising budget and to really revamp all the branding. And I'd lost all the momentum that I could have had with all of my existing clients from a brand name that I really could no longer try to continue with. Um, so yeah, I mean, just seeing those, I feel like seeing those two stories side by side, it's like if anybody who's trying to start, the, like even with uh, what you were talking about before with, with Dan Millen, like he's trying to build a brand before there's a product. It's so yeah. important. It's so yeah. important. Make yeah. that your focus and then the products will take care of themselves. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm pleased to say this is becoming more of a theme now. Um, there's a few things that I see emerging in the kind of the thought leadership space of e-commerce now, which are quite pleasing. So one is transparency, people actually talking about what they've done. And what's great about that is by default, it then filters out the, you know, the BS gurus who either don't share what they've done because they've done nothing or don't share what they've done because what they did sucked. Um, and actually talking about what you've done in public is is great because people can see that you're legit and sharing your mistakes and your experiences, you know? I'm building a brand now in the parent and baby space and once it's ready, I'm gonna like release the documentation of like everything we've done and show everyone. And if it fails, well, cool, we've documented the failure. That'll be an interesting lesson, won't it? So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, but again, you're building a brand in something that you care about right now. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's a, it's a product that I'm developing based on like an experience. Like uh, I used a product, I didn't like the performance, so I'm making a better one. Yeah. That's, that, and that's, that's the way to do it. And now you can be the spokesperson for that. You can relate to your customers. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I will. And, and I can't share this quite yet, but when I can, there's a funny, funny story about how, about me being the spokesperson for this brand to the to the point that I'm I'm going to become qualified in something that you wouldn't expect a 35 year old guy to become qualified in, <laughs> purely <laughs> so that I can be on authority on it, engage with my customers, create amazing content, and it, it creates a really fun talking point. Um, it's in the baby that. space. People can maybe have a guess about wh what I'm getting qualified in. Uh, I'll be able to share it a bit later this year when we launch on Kickstarter. Oh, now there's a whole nother. That's another episode. Now we're going to have to do an episode for the book and an episode for the Kickstarter. Yeah, no kidding. Kickstarter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're busy. You're busy, right? Yeah. The book, launching a yeah. new brand. But the thing is, I'm busy, but I partner, right? Mm -hmm. The Kickstarter. I'm working with a great agency to help me do that. Why? Because I'm not an idiot. I don't know how to do a Kickstarter. <laughs> so I'm going to work with a professional who knows. Someone else knows how to do it. Yep. Why would I? Who knows how to do it, Chris? No, I so said you're right. Get somebody yeah. else who knows how to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and I'll learn. Yeah. Um, so that's that's how I do things. You know, I partner on things and I learn from people who already know what they're doing. I'd rather get, take advice from experts. And, you know, I've kind of, I have this mantra that I, I stick by now in, in life and business, which is cheap is expensive and expensive is cheap. Or, or way, another way to think about it is cheap becomes expensive and expensive becomes cheap. If you if you try and do it on the cheap, it'll eventually be really expensive because you'll get it wrong and you have to do it again and again and again until you get it right and then eventually give up and actually work with an expert. 
And if you do it expensive, it becomes cheap because you get it right the first time. Yep. It's so true. I mean, we I can't tell you how many people we talk to that are getting into this game, getting into this space. They've they've quote unquote followed step by step all of the right steps to get you know a product launch. Then they come to us because their advertising's through the roof to even try to sell something. And it's because it's a it they don't have a brand. It's a product. There's a million of them. Uh, and that, yeah, that, jump that rope. is like a jump rope, <laughs> uh, lots of those. Um, but that, that's where the cheap, they were trying to say, look, how can I just order something straight from Alibaba? Maybe only order a thousand units. And then all of a sudden it's not cheap anymore. They're going to either have to liquidate it or they're going to have to, you know, ramp up their ad spend super high to get rid of it. Um, and it won't work and they won't make any money off of it. And it just became expensive. And you're exactly right. And they yep. got to do it again if they want to stay in the game. Yeah. And now they're running out of money. And now they're, and now they're running out of money. Yeah. Well, man, we, okay, we are going to, now that you've, so you got so much going on, I can't wait to hear your, uh, your story about becoming a spokesperson for this brand and what you're going to be uh, a certified expert in that way. <laughs> uh, and also <laughs> your book coming out, really excited to, to, yeah. to that read that talk about that so we'll definitely be getting you you back on in the future and, and today was great we'll talk about some good burgers we got yeah I, I just realized the conversation went in a totally different way than we even thought it might which is cool like this is usually what happens. Podcasts are like that. you just kind of have a chat and see what happens yeah that's my favorite i mean that's like going to a, a meetup and sitting down with a like-minded seller and just talking yeah you know and just i that's it's what I love about these events, like the event I was just at. Yeah, the presentations are great, like they are. And I enjoyed learning from like really smart people. But then it's the chats that you have over coffee and dinner and the after party yeah. and breakfast yeah. in the morning in the hotel. That's where you learn from like-minded people. and You get their number and you join a little WhatsApp group and people are chucking the stuff around. Again, and this is why you don't need to spend thousands of dollars in joining one of these cult-like groups, you know? <laughs> Um, because you can just do it yourself and meet great people. You are right. You're right. I love it. I, I love it, Ben. This has been great. Everyone, think about your brand. Use some of these burgers that Ben laid out and just build your tribe around your brand. If you're ever looking to exit, that's going to clearly help facilitate that, help your multiplier. Ben can help you with that too. <laughs> uh, yeah. working, working with Ben, but appreciate it man thanks for taking the time to join us we'll we'll definitely schedule to get you back on uh when these next things pop up your book and your your new product launch so we'd love to talk about all of that and more but cool yeah thanks for having me i really enjoyed this always fun talking to you guys absolutely well thanks ben thanks everybody for tuning in we'll be back at this again soon have a great day